If you will permit us to move the mic along, being careful not to trip either over the rubble of treaties or the ruins of Rotterdam, we'll have a word with the same little man who last month pasted Denmark and Norway in his scrapbook. I'll... Will you explain why Rotterdam was bombed and thousands of its people killed after the city had surrendered? Yeah, sure. Schrecklichkeit. What's that? Frightfulness, it means. Frightfulness? Yeah. That was our plan. You mean Schrecklichkeit is an official policy of the German High Command? Yeah. Hmm. You seem to be feeling pretty chipper. Holland fell to us in four days, Denmark in one. And France? We will be in Paris before the end of June. Scene. A clearing in the forest of Compiègne before the end of June. Occasion, unconditional surrender of liberté, égalité, fraternité. Cast, Hitler, the sunshine boy. Goering, of the splendid Nordic belly. Von Brauchitsch, the man who looks like a rat. Ribbentrop, the rat who looks like a man. Assorted admirals, generals, flunkies, plenipotentiary. Shira, the reporter, stands at the edge of the clearing, watching the party advance to the armistice car. His eyes are on the face of the Fuhrer, who the other day did a little dance for the newsreel cameras when he learned the good news of the death of France. He glances slowly around the clearing, and now, as his eyes meet ours, you grasp the depth of his hatred. Revengeful, triumphant hate. Suddenly, as though his face were not giving quite complete expression to his feelings, he throws his whole body into harmony with his mood. He swiftly snaps his hands on his hips, arches his shoulders, plants his feet wide apart. It is a magnificent gesture of burning contempt of this place. The gloating hour is to be remembered. File it away in a bomb-proof corner if such there be, against a better time, if such can possibly arrive. Meanwhile, other gestures of contempt soon fill the night skies over London. A cocky pilot, little man with wings, smiles in German, and the bombardier spits on his punctual hands, in forewarning of which below the news is published on the blacked-out air, and the workers of Britain... In bed with the aches of a long day at the factory. Overtime, no Sundays off. Roused now from their body-warm blankets in the cold room. Shuffle along to the damp shelter. Bleary, pooped out, hoping not to catch a direct hit or a sore throat. And, inevitably, in some postal zone or other, the hit is a direct hit. And the kid with the bright blonde hair and the turned-up nose moans all night among the rubble because his left leg hangs in blackened tatters. And he cries to his mother, who is dead. The siren is a musician of no value, knowing only one tune, which each time played is a disturbance of the peace. Oh, in the prime of the Luftwaffe, When there was nothing west of Dunkirk save prospects of invasion, the tenor of life in London was considerably beneath that of Berlin. For whereas the pubs of Westminster burned like books and synagogues, and the waters of the estuary blazed with oil, the warm cafes of Kurfürstendamm were busy and gay, and there was boating in the Tiergarten, The waltzes of J. Strauss of Austria, now part of the Reich, were especially lilting in the ballroom of the Adlon. The dances of A. Dvorak of Bohemia, lately absorbed by the greater Germany, were gay as could be. And the contralto and the rothskeller, a brim with charm, sang feelingly the leader of E. Grieg of Norway, Reich Protectorate. And war was 
glorious. And the best champagnes of France were poured on the tables of the Schutzstaffel. The finest grades of Danish bacon sputtered in the skillets of loyal party workers. Paintings from the Louvre hung tastefully on the walls of Berchtesgaden. And the iron ore of Sweden alloyed well with the bauxite of Spain. The music was but stimulating and the performance but continuous. With a minor fanfare for the pushovers in the Balkans in the month of April. It's a special presentation of one of the best hours in the history of radio. On a note of triumph continues next time.